in uh, verses uh, 1 through 8, we're talking about Peter and Cornelius of Acts chapter 10. Beginning there in verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian Regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it? Lord. So he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his, two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. So uh, here's another account of, uh, of a God-fearing centurion. We've already heard about, in, in the New Testament, we've already heard about one. Uh, who was the other centurion, you remember? that was talked about when Christ was alive. Over in uh, Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 13, or Luke chapter 7, 1 through 10, uh, it talks about another uh, uh, centurion, and remember his servant was ill and about to die, so then he sent... He had heard about Jesus, and he sent word to him and said, ask one Christ to come and heal his servant. Uh, but before Christ had made it that far, he said he wasn't worthy for, you know, uh, for Christ to come into his house, that if he just said the word, then his servant would be healed. So that's, that's, the, other, sir, that's the other centurion that, uh, that we read about. And that particular uh, centurion was a God-fearing uh, person, it seems, and he loved the Jewish people and even built them a, a Jewish synagogue. So uh, that's recorded there. Uh, so what do we know about this, this person, this uh, centurion here in Acts? So uh, we see that he lived in Caesarea, and, of course, he was a centurion. And so that means he's a captain over about 100 men. And uh, he was at the Italian band or cohort. Uh, so that particular uh, group of soldiers, is, is, uh, they're from, from Italy. And uh, so uh, they're uh, made up of 6 to 10 centuries, which is 600 to 1,000 soldiers. And uh, <clears throat> and thinking of of, um, of bands and uh, uh, centuries, with, uh, Rome, a Roman legion was three thousand to six thousand soldiers. So um, anyway, he uh, this uh, centurion was a devout man, one who feared God. His household feared God, as he was the leader of his household. Uh, servants and children, his family, and stuff like that. Uh, so um, he was directing them, and they feared God. He was teaching them. Uh, we see that he was charitable. And we see that he prayed to God always. So can it be said of us, do we pray always? Um, that doesn't mean praying continuously all the time, but it, it means very frequently. So in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, what does that say? It says for us to pray without ceasing. So that's the kind of 
That's the kind of relationship we need to have with God is that we're going to him a lot. And we are praying for many things. So for us, we've got many things to to pray about. We've got each other to pray about. We've got this this congregation to pray about. We've got there are other uh, congregations that that you may have information about. You pray about them. You pray about your direct family. So you know uh, your family, extended family, and and everything. So there's a lot of things to pray about, and it takes a lot of time to cover all of that stuff. But at the same time, you're praying for your strength and your growth and everything, and that you're understanding what what God wants you to do and how to live. So uh, we see that this centurion was praying about at the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m., which is the usual hour of the evening worship among the Jews. So that was, that was you know, their habits. Uh, so uh, here's, here's a, a centurion. So we know these things about him, but it never says that he was a proselyte. A proselyte is one that accepts the Jewish teaching and follows the rules. That means he's going to be circumcised. He's going to circumcise the males of his family. Uh, he's going to follow all of those things. He's going to be going you know, to Jerusalem and things like that for the feasts and stuff like that. that that's what a proselyte is. Uh, but uh, we don't know that about this man. We just know that he's a God-fearing man. So, when we look at, he's praying. So, and we know that God heard and heard his prayer. So, when we think about, uh, we need to look at who does God hear in, in prayer. So, does God hear a sinner's prayer? You know, a person who is willfully in sin, does God hear that person? You know, uh, so, or a man who has not been baptized, he still has his sins, does God hear that man? Uh, so, the answer is kind of yes and no. Um, so, we look over in John chapter 9, uh, you know, to look at the words of the blind man. This is a blind man that Jesus was healed, and he's trying to give a defense of, of what had happened. And uh, <clears throat> he's... Uh, <coughs> <coughs> the Pharisees and everybody are, 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 have, have got him... And they're questioning him. So in verse 30, it says, The man answered and said to them, Why? This is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from. Yet he has opened my eyes. In verse 31, and that's the verse we need to pay attention to. Now we know that God does not hear sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will... He hears him. Um, so, uh, in uh, Psalms chapter 66, verse 18, it says, uh, uh, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. If my behavior is directed away from God and, the things of, and towards the things of this world... Uh, you know, and he's filled with, he has iniquity in his heart, God's not going to hear that person. Uh, over in Psalms chapter 34, verses 15 through 17, it says, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Uh, over in James 5.16, he talks about the value of a faithful person 
saying the effective, effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So, you know, uh, there, there's a difference, you know, and different people are praying. Uh, I've seen godless people pray. You know, when they're really in trouble, that's when they start calling on the name of God. Does God hear them? That is, that is true, but it also says he doesn't hear a sinner's prayer. So, you know, say that again. Okay, so, so that's, that's the point. If you are leaning towards God and you're trying to, to go that way, God's going to help you in getting that answer. That's that's the boat that Cornelius was in. Gene? Okay, so uh, the, the verse uh, Acts twenty two sixteen 16 has uh, been brought up saying that calling on the name of the Lord is the act of baptism alone. Okay, so uh, I, don't, I don't agree with that. I, I, I think it says, and now while you are waiting, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. So one of the things you have to do is hear, believe, confess. You know, those are there's there's not just one thing you got to do is being baptized. And one is calling on the name of the Lord. You've got to confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So I think that Acts 22 uh, verse 16 to say that calling on the name of the Lord is not just simply the act of baptism by itself. I think it's talking about that whole context of what we do have to do to be saved. Any, any other comments? So, um, to look at calling on the name of the Lord, uh, the, good, the good thing is that's not the only verse. There's lots of verses that talk about calling on the name of the Lord. The question is, right? Right. That's right. That's exactly right. So, if you are intent in sinning, that's your direction. Okay? When you say... I'm about to be killed because of my behavior. I'm drunken and I'm, I'm about to be killed in a wreck and I'm calling on a, out on the name of God. God doesn't hear that. That's a sinner's prayer that God does not hear. But Cornelius, he's, he doesn't seem like that kind of person. He is a God-fearing man. He is ignorant He's ignorant, and he's trying to learn what God wants him to do. So, um, if you look at Cornelius, God is hearing him. And how do we know? He, yes, he was a God-fearing man. So, how do we know that God heard him? Because he answered him. That's exactly right. Um, I... I I, I know of, of, of things in, uh, in my life that God was hearing a sinner's prayer. Uh, even though I had my sins, I hadn't been baptized or anything, you know, when I'm leaning towards that direction and I'm trying and seeking God, yeah, he's hearing me and he provides providential care to help us out. So... Um, when, when we look at prayer, 
even if we are baptized, you can be in a situation where God's not hearing your prayer. Yeah, but at the same time, you know, when does God not hear us? Even though we've been baptized and our sins were washed away, when does God not hear us? Say that again, Gene. That's right. That's exactly right. So uh, God hears us if we're obedient. First uh, John three twenty two through twenty four. Um, right. If we do the will of the Father, and we read that in John uh, nine uh, thirty one, where the the blind man is saying, "But if anyone is a worshipper of God and does His will." He hears him. So uh, 1 Peter 3.12 says that, you know, when we're righteous, that's when God hears us. Well, how, how can we be righteous? Um, you know, we think, of, well, no one can be righteous except for God. But when, I, when God says, tell the truth, and I tell the truth, I am being righteous when I tell the truth. Right, and so we do the exact same thing. We're trying to reach out and draw people in so that they have an opportunity to have their sins wash away. We call sinners, right? So, but, but we're talking about what, what God hears uh, in, in prayer. Um, again, it's, it's a, if we're asking something according to God's will, 1 John 5.14 uh, James chapter 1, verses 5 through 7 talks about asking in faith. You have to have a level of faith. Uh, you have to have the right motive. Uh, James 4, uh, verses 3 through uh, 6. Um, so uh, let's read that. James chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. It says, you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace, therefore he says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Um, so, you know, just when you're praying, if you've got that humility and you're, you're trying to do what God says, then God is hearing you. But when you are bent on doing certain sin, oh, I don't, I don't kill anybody. I don't do this. I don't do that. But I can't, you know, I'm weak and I do this over here. You know, well, if you're doing that willfully, then God, then you've got a problem. That's That particular sin is separating you from God. And, um, you know, does he hear or not? You know, you're, you're, your, uh, your prayers are going to be hindered in that, in that particular situation. Uh, Mark 11, verse 24 says we've got to be believing. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 15 says we've got to pray with understanding. Uh, Philippians 4, 6, with thanksgiving. 1 Timothy 2, 8, without wrath and doubting. Uh, Colossians 3, 17 says pray in the name of our Lord uh, so, and, and whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father uh, through him. So that, that includes praying. So, yes, God did hear the prayer of Cornelius, one in need 
of having his sins washed away in baptism. Acts 10.4 uh, is where it says that. Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. So, uh, Cornelius was a very religious man with very high morals, but it wasn't enough for salvation. And that's where the problem was. We, we see people sometimes, they're very, they've, they've got very high morals. And they do a lot of many, many good things, and they're very pious and religious. Um, so, so he was a very religious person, a pious man, a devout man, but he still needed to wash his sins away. So being religious and a man with very high morals is simply not enough for salvation. He needs more. He's got to have his sins washed away. And that's what he was, trying to, he was trying to get at. So what do we know about the prayers of Cornelius? What did he pray for? So the Bible doesn't tell us uh, what he prayed for, but it does tell the answer provided by God. Um, so um, uh, it seems that Cornelius was praying for more knowledge and maybe a closer relationship with God, to know more about God's will. So this is what, this is what God provided to Cornelius uh, through Peter. Well, no, he was sending for Peter. Who did he send to go get Peter? Right. Right. So, how many people? So, we got, we got three people, right? We're, that's right. So, at least three. And a devout soldier. That's who went. Okay, so uh, over in uh, verses 9 through 33, it covers Peter's vision. So meanwhile, these men are traveling to, to go uh, get to Joppa to look for Peter. They got to find the house and everything. So, um, so as they continued on their journey and approached Joppa, Peter went up on the housetop specifically to pray. And it was the sixth hour, which is 12 noon. So uh, lunchtime, but, you know, it's also the hour of prayer. So he was up there praying, and uh, so he wasn't sleeping and was fully awake when he saw this vision, which is like a trance. <coughs> so in his trance, Peter saw a sheet bound at the four corners and all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. These were the things that separated Jew from Gentile. So that's what God is getting at with Peter. He's pointing to something specific. It, uh, it's not about what he's about to eat or anything or what he's eaten in the past. It's about the thing that divides Jew and Gentile. 
so, um, to the Jew, there were clear, very clear distinctions between holy and unholy, between unclean and clean. Uh, Leviticus 10.10 10, uh, uh, says that you may distinguish between holy and unholy and between unclean and clean. Uh, so the law of Moses established that uh, uh, to, you know, to, to the Jews who were there with Moses. And uh, so uh, the law of clean and unclean animals was established in Leviticus chapter 11. So, the concept was not new. It was mentioned in Noah, you know, to Noah in Genesis chapter 7, verse 2. And verse 8, in the commands of what to load in the ark. Um, so, the concept is again mentioned in Leviticus 5, verses 2 and 3. So it was a concept known since the beginning of man when he was commanded to sacrifice to God as, uh, as far as worship. So uh, he couldn't sacrifice just any old animal. There were specific animals that he was told to sacrifice. So it goes all the way back to the beginning. It just comes out a lot more in the uh, in Leviticus when, when uh, the laws are being covered, and we see it more in, in detail about what God says about that. Uh, so, uh, in verses uh, 13 through 15, in Acts chapter 10, it says, And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, what God has cleansed you must not call common. So it is presumed that Jesus was speaking to Peter. Uh, in your Bibles, if you've got red, red letters for the words of Jesus, this probably acts um, uh, in verse 13 and verse 15, what, what is being said is in red, indicating it would be from Christ. But that's just that's just presumed, and there's nothing, nothing wrong with that. Um, um, so, the word Lord, in verse 14, he says, not so, Lord. That word is kurios, uh, which means supremacy, which, which is supreme in authority. Uh, that is, it's it, uh, a controller. Um, so, you know, that's, um, that's the definition of, of that word. So it doesn't seem like just a person. It's, you know, he's talking, you know, I mean, it's not an angel that's saying this. It's, you know, so this is supreme authority. Angels don't have that kind of authority. So that's why it's presumed to be Christ. Uh, so this was done three times to show the certainty and importance of what God wanted Peter to understand, verse 16. So Peter knew it was important, but still did not understand what God was showing him. He's trying to figure it out. So uh, at that point, the three men <coughs> from Caesarea arrived at Simon the Tanner's house and asked if Peter was there. They finally found the house that they were looking for, Simon the Tanner's house, to get, get there. Now they've got to inquire, you know, is Simon Peter here? So uh, verse um, 17 and 18. So now while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. So 
At that point, while that's going on, they're asking, is he here? At the same time, what is going on with Peter is the Holy Spirit speaking to him uh, while he's trying to understand what this vision means. Um, Peter was commanded by the Holy Spirit to go with them doubting nothing. So who, who are the men that are coming? Say that again, Faye. Three men, but who, but what? Right. And were they Jews? Yes. So are they Jew or Gentile? They're Gentiles. So uh, in the past, Jews aren't supposed to be going with Gentiles, right? So the Holy Spirit's directing him specifically, go with them even though they're Gentiles. So, um, so that takes away doubt. So Peter was commanded to do that. So the, the, um, the men were sent by the Holy Spirit to retrieve Peter. So this is all the working of the Holy Spirit. So um, Peter... In, in uh, verses 21 through 23, Peter learns why the men who were Gentiles came. So uh, he understood that the men came to him and that he was supposed to go with them to Caesarea. Uh, and this was clearly being directed by God. <coughs> he didn't understand the meaning of the vision, <coughs> but Peter went with them the following day and took six men with him. Um, so, uh, um, so uh, we see that in uh, Acts chapter 11, verse 12, that he took six men with him. So, um, so they go, and then uh, Cornelius was ready for Peter's arrival having gathered his relatives and close friends, verse 24. Peter entered the home, and Cornelius bowed down and worshipped Peter, but Peter tells him to stop. So, um, uh, verse 25 says, As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him, but Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. So commentators suggest that Cornelius was doing nothing more than greeting and paying homage to Peter as a, as a great, you know, kind of a great person. Um, so uh, since the word worship can mean worship to deity or to prostrate, prostrate oneself in homage. Um, so... If Cornelius was paying homage to Peter, then verse 26 doesn't make much sense, at least to me. Uh, but Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. That doesn't make sense if he's just paying homage to Peter. It had to th Say that again. Yes, but, but that word worship can also mean, you know, like you're like before a king, you know, and you're bowing down. It could also mean that. So, uh, but it can also mean worship to deity. And so we have to look at the actions that, you know, that are going on, what Peter said. He says, I'm also a man. You don't, you don't say that to you know, to a king, you know, a king doesn't say that, you know, don't bow down to me. I'm just a man. Everybody there knows he's a man. So it doesn't make sense. So in my opinion, that's uh, Cornelius was looking at Peter as deity, um, or at least at that level. So what does Peter find in the house? He finds a large group of gathered at the house. And at some point, Peter made the connection between the vision he received and God's direction to go to the Gentiles, obviously to teach them the gospel. 
That was the purpose of going, and that was becoming more and more clear. Uh, but they're Gentiles. Uh, so apparently God said this distinction that you used to have is no more. Jew and Gentile are the same in the sense, you know, the way God looks at them. So salvation is coming to the Gentiles. So Cornelius explains why he called for Peter, verses 30 through 33. Um, so we learn supplemental information about what Cornelius was doing before the angel appeared and about the angel. Well, we, we heard before that he was just praying and this angel appeared. But here we get a little bit more information. And we find out that Cornelius was fasting before his prayer at 3 p.m. So, uh, and then also we learn a little bit more about the angel. It said the angel appeared in the form of a man having bright clothing. So um, this angel looks like a man. And he's got bright clothing. So <coughs> we learn that through those verses. So, uh, looking at, moving on to Acts chapter 10, verse 34 through 43. Uh, this is, you know, Gentiles are hearing the good news. Beginning there in verse 34. Then Peter, obtained, op then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. So that's kind of what we were talking about before. Uh, whoever fears God and is leaning towards God, working righteousness, uh, is accepted by it, it's accepted by God. So Cornelius is, is being accepted, but Peter, he needs more information about what he needs to do to get rid of his sins. There in verse 36, the word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and, and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with the power who went out doing good and healing all who were opposed by the devil for God was with him. And we are witnesses. <coughs> Excuse me. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to the witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witnesses, all the prophets witness that through his name whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. So Peter in verse 43, we see that Peter's, you know, describing what you got to do to receive remission of sins. What's he talking about there? Is you got to believe. You got to believe in the things that God is commanding you to do, and that and that Christ has commanded us to do. So uh, that's that's belief is what leads to that uh, removal of spring, of sins. It's not the believe, and that's all you do. It's, it's the first step that you take. Uh, going on in verses 44 through 48. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who received the Holy Spirit just as we have? 
And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. So um, when Peter says, <coughs> Peter's still talking to them when the Holy Spirit falls on them. So um, he's telling them, you know, that they're going to have to believe on him for the remission of sins. So before they were baptized, they're receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. So um, it fell on those who heard. We got to hear. We got to believe. The Holy Spirit fell on them. And again, we're talking about this miraculous a thing that's occurring that only occurred back in the first century, and it's occurring to the Gentiles in a miraculous way. Uh, we've seen before that what does it take for somebody to receive the Holy Spirit in, in a level where they can perform a miracle or healing or anything like that, receive the, the uh, nine different gifts, and apostles got to lay hands on them. Peter didn't lay hands on these people, okay? So um, the, the Holy Spirit's just falling on them. And uh, so the six men who came with Peter were astonished that the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles, verse 45. And uh, what was the evidence that they received the Holy Spirit? They spoke in foreign language, languages. And uh, so... It was now completely obvious to Peter that salvation was also for the Gentiles. Peter exclaimed, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? <coughs> so, again, some claim that, you know, you, you know, well, I was baptized by the Holy Spirit. You know, that, that's not what's going on here. That, you know, so their, their, their thinking is not correct. Uh, because when we look at what's going on here, they're receiving the Holy Spirit, but they still have their sins. They still have to be baptized. So Peter gives them a command. Verse 48 Baptism is a command. So how sad it is there are so many lost in denominations who absolutely refuse to be baptized. I'm saved by belief only. All I got to do is say I'm, I, I accept Jesus in my heart and I'm saved. Well, they're ignoring the command by God to be baptized. Uh, so... So when we look at what is going on here, um, so having been Pete, with Peter, having been given the keys uh, of the kingdom of heaven, Peter opened the doors of the church to the Jews first and now to the Gentiles. Uh, so in, um, we know that that was give that. Uh, was, was, was given by a direction by Christ. Over in Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 through 19, and uh, Christ had asked Peter, and he said to them, but who, he asked all the apostles, uh, he, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So we understand through that that Peter was given the keys to open the doors to the church. First to the Gentiles, I mean first to the Jews, and then to the Gentiles. So here in Acts chapter 10, the doors being opened to the Gentiles. There's no other record 
of a Gentile receiving uh, that <coughs> salvation <coughs> that the gospel was preached to. We have Gentiles who became proselytes and followed the Jewish uh, law, but this is different. Uh, what what's going on here? Any questions, real quick? All right, so we'll we'll conclude there, and we'll begin next Sunday with uh, chapter eleven.